All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third and final lecture of the 2023 Julian J. Rothbaum Distinguished Lectureship on Representative Governments. Uh, on behalf of the Carl Albert Congressional Research and Studies Center and the Rothbaum family, uh, I am the director of the center. I uh, want to thank you for your attendance at this biannual event. Uh, we sponsor this lectureship to bring together scholars, students, and citizens to nurture the values of a representative democracy. Through our mission and in our center programs, we strive to thank, strengthen representative democracy through engaged and informed citizens. Um, I want to take just a second here to thank some people who participated in uh, the various events uh, over the week. Uh, we do have the three lectures, but we also hosted a round table. Uh, we had a, a dinner last night, and our speaker puts in a lot of work across these uh, different events. Um, I want to thank Dr. Brian Pugh. Most of these people have left now, uh, maybe for the football game. Uh, or other places. Uh, uh, Brian Pugh is the director of the Senate Center, so he had other uh, uh, important business to attend to. Uh, and Professor Hank Jenkins-Smith, who is uh, part of IPRA and the Political Science Department, they participated in a roundtable yesterday along with our speaker uh, talking about public policy. Um, I want to make sure to thank the students and the staff at the Carl Albert Center for all the work they put into this event. Um, so please take a minute to thank Catherine McRae, Kristen McMurray, Kay Blunk, Jay Price, Jamie Hunter, Peter McLaughlin, Nathan Barron, Peter Olson, Joy Rhodes, Michael Stoyak, Annie Mullins, Jordan Brown, John V. Patel, and Savannah Slayton for the work they put in, uh, handing out programs, driving people around. Uh, no one crashed the golf carts, uh, so that's, that's really good. So I just want to say thanks uh, them. Um, and although he had to travel back to Washington, D.C. today, um, I want to thank Joel Jankowski. So Joel, along with his mother, Irene, uh, endowed this lecture lectureship. Um, Joel has been a great supporter uh, of the lecture. He's been to all of them. He helps from picking the, the speaker um, to making sure we have a great event every year. So again, Joel's back in DC, but I just want to say thank you, Joel. And then finally, I want to thank our lecturer, Professor Frances Lee, for her work. As I said, um, it's not just the three lectures. Um, there's a meeting with students. There was a round table. There was a panel last night with uh, President Pro Tem Treat, who was uh, thankful to, to join us last night. Um, so it's a lot of work. And then Professor Lee is going to go back uh, to, to Princeton and start you know, working on her book that's going to come out of this series. Uh, so thank you for all of your work. So let me um, just move on here. The, uh, the center is proud to host its 21st Rothbaum lecturer, Francis Lee. Professor Lee is a professor of politics and public affairs at Princeton University with a joint appointment in the Department of Politics in the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. She has a broad interest in American politics with a special focus on congressional politics, national policy making, and party politics and representation. She is the author and co-author of five books about the US Congress, and her papers have appeared in all the top journals. Uh, Professor Lee has been awarded the Fenno Prize, which I was reminded last night. Uh, Professor Fenno uh, gave this lecture um, back in, in the early years. So we've had a, a great run of speakers, enough that we now name prizes after them. Uh, other awards are the D.B. Hardiman Prize, the Gladys, Gladys M. Kammerer Award, and the E.E. E. Schottschneider Award. Professor Lee is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and was an APSA Congressional Fellow. Uh, Professor Lee earned her BA from the University of Southern Mississippi and her PhD from Vanderbilt University. So over the last two days, um, we've learned a lot about Congress, uh, both as a representative body and how it does a good job of representing various interests and opinions and geographies across the country. And then yesterday, we learned about when Congress does decide to pass legislation, um, it's frequently much more bipartisan um, than we might expect, given what we read in the media about what happens in Congress. And in today's lecture, Professor Lee will teach us about how the legislative branch can hold the executive branch accountable through its um, ability to hold oversight. So Professor Lee, the podium is yours. Welcome. Hi, 
Th thanks, Mike, uh, and thanks to you all for your uh, attention through a series of lectures. Uh, uh, given the uh, implausible title of Two Cheers for Congress. Let me try to figure out what this is. That's not showing up on my screen. Let me try to make it go away. I don't see that error message here. I don't know why it's displaying up there. Now it's on this one. <laughs> Say later? Yeah. Okay. All right, later. <laughs> so yes, I, pre I appreciate your willingness to give a lecture series with the title, Two Cheers for Congress, an open-minded hearing. Uh, today is the third uh, in the series. Uh, the title for today's lecture is uh, uh, drawn from the Declaration of Independence. You probably recognize it. The, the line falls right after the Declaration accuses King George III of a history of repeated injuries and abuses. Uh, it's, uh, it's aimed at the established that, uh, according to the Declaration, those, uh, uh, those repeated uh, injuries and abuses were aimed at the establishment of a tyranny over the states. As evidence for this claim, the document continues with the line, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Then the declaration follows up with a long series of specific injuries and abuses of power, laying out the reasons why the colonies intended to establish a new form of government. The Declaration of Independence was a legislative document in that it was written uh, and adopted by the Second Continental Congress. It was an expression of a set of grievances. Like the many similar documents routinely published by legislatures today, it was aimed both at an executive official, King George, and also at a broader public. The public expression of grievances stands at the core of what legislatures do. Legislatures give voice to their constituents' objections to government policy and lay those at the feet of executives whatever form, whether that be kings, to presidents, to executive agencies, prime ministers, governors. Legislatures publicly express their disagreements, object to the course of policy, point to their constituents' unmet needs. They charge presidents and agencies with abuses of power. These are fundamental functions functions that date back to the earliest convenings of legislative bodies are, are assemblies that we can recognize um, as uh, legislatures and parliaments. Again, the title, Let Facts Be Submitted to a Candid World. The word candid is archaic in this case. It means unbiased. Let facts be submitted to an unbiased world. What this line also points to is that the legislature envisions an audience beyond the chief executive, a broader public. In some cases, and in fact in the case of the Declaration of Independence itself, a global public. A public that may or may not have any formed opinions on the issues. A public who can be persuaded or not be persuaded by the points being made in legislative debate and documents. This grievance expressing function of legislatures long predates the existence of the US Congress, even predates the colonial legislatures. In coming together to publicize a list of grievances in this way, the Second Continental Congress was doing what legislatures had been doing with executive officials for centuries by that point. At the earliest root of modern executive legislative relations is a basic exchange in which rulers listen to grievances in order to obtain consent of the governed. These practices emerged in 13th century Western Europe and were initially unique to the region. NYU political scientist David Stasevich argues that the likely explanation for the emergence of these political practices at that time and place was because Western European leaders were 
in global perspective, uniquely weak. After the fall of the Western Roman, Roman Empire, political power in Western Europe was highly fragmented. There was little state capacity, there less than existed in other major world regions. Most importantly, Western European rulers lacked any centralized bureaucracy for tax collection. A contrast at the time with the Byzantine Empire, the Abbasid Caliphate, and China's Song Dynasty. Western European rulers were not in a position to obtain revenue bureaucratically or by force. They needed to draw together assemblies in order to obtain consent for taxation. This fundamental institutional relationship would eventually be built into the constitutional system through the US. When the executive branch needs revenue, needs to be obtained by winning support. When the executive needs funds, they need to be authorized by the legislature. The Congress is the means by which, uh, or the, the, the mechanism by which uh, the executive branch turns to, to win that necessary support. And then in turn, to get that support from Congress, presidents have to listen to the grievances that members of Congress will express and then make necessary accommodations. But it's important to be aware that this relationship, listening to grievances and obtaining consent, existed long before legislatures had any of the formal legal constitutional rights that they possess today. Uh, it existed before the US Constitution and before the colonial legislatures. And it existed before what we think of as modern lawmaking and legislation. Consent of the governed is needed if a government lacks the will or the capacity to obtain its ends through more coercive means. Airing grievances remains one of the most important functions of Congress still. As with the facts submitted to a candid world, Congress's power in this regard rests greatly on its powers of publicity. These powers of publicity are partly institutional in nature, as in the hearings and the debates that Congress holds, the resolutions that it passes, along with the attention the news media pay to those activities. But individual members also have a lot of publicity power themselves, more than they used to, in fact. They can reach audiences of their own and on their own initiative, both through the media and the variety of other platforms available to them. Unlike many of uh, Congress's other institutional powers, as in the power of the purse, the power to legislate, the powers of publicity are not heavily monopolized by leadership. Critics still have their say in Congress, even though leaders uh, wield agenda control. Opponents to leadership have no difficulty making themselves heard, uh, loudly at times, very loudly, especially you know, over the past week. Um, as discussed in yesterday's lecture, both sides of measures are given equal time in Congress to make their case. So much of Congress's grievance expressing function plays out beyond the institution altogether, on cable television, on social media, in newspapers, in meeting places in the constituency, in all the communications that individual members continually engage in. Even when Congress takes no other actions on uh, such matters, on the issues on which grievances are being expressed. In other words, even at times when Congress enacts no legislation, grievance airing is still an important political act one that has broad ranging effects on politics and on administration. In this afternoon's lectures, we'll explore two sets of questions. First, how and why are Congress's powers of debate and publicity important for uh, executive accountability? And why and when does Congress use those powers to hold executives accountable? So first on the first question, how and why are Congress's powers of debate and publicity important? It's important because congressional debate informs the president and executive branch about problems. It's easy for government agencies to lose touch with public sentiment or to be unaware 
of unanticipated downsides or consequences of their actions. When people are unhappy with administration policy for whatever reason, that unhappiness often gets communicated to Congress and Congress members. And Congress, in turn, has many ways to make itself heard. Presidents and executive agencies are well advised to listen to these grievances and to try to find ways to address them. And they will govern better if they do. This line of argument is hardly original with me. It goes back long before the founding of the American Constitution to the struggles um, to assert the Parliament's role relative to the king. Uh, let me give you some, uh, some quotations, some lines from a, a wonderful, mostly forgotten text laying out the case for legislative assemblies. This is from a 1688 pamphlet entitled The Character of a Trimmer. It's written by George Saville, the Marquess of Halifax. He was a 17th century English statesman, a member of a prominent political family. He had served as a party leader in Parliament, as well as in influential positions under both James II and Charles II. This, the pamphlet was written before the Glorious Revolution and the establishment of parliamentary supremacy. Saville's main aim in the pamphlet is to convince rulers that they should listen to the grievances expressed in Parliament. He is not advancing legal or philosophical arguments about Parliament's proper role. He's saying, look, Parliament is useful. If you listen to it, you will learn from it what the people will accept, what is tolerable to them, what angers them, what problems need addressing, and what they will consent to. A couple of quotations here. Our, uh, our trimmer, meaning uh, himself as an author, our trimmer is a friend to parliaments. Notwithstanding all their faults and excesses, which of late have given such matter of objection to them. He thinketh that though they may at some times be troublesome to authority, yet they add the greatest strength to it under a wise administration. Now power cannot be obtained by force alone upon people. Let it be never so great. There must be their consent too. He's saying whatever formal power you might possess as king, you'd be best advised to exercise it in light of what is acceptable to Parliament and by extension to, to the people beyond Parliament. It will make you stronger if you do. In another interesting passage, the author goes on to describe Parliament as a physician to the king. There can be hardly any sudden disease come upon us, but that the king may have time enough left to consult with his physicians in Parliament. Just as a physician can advise you how to treat a disease, he's saying that Parliament can advise you on how to proceed in addressing problems or threats to the body politic. Along these lines, here's a memorable, often cited quotation from Thomas Jefferson, writing from his role as Secretary of State to Senator John Rutherford of New Jersey. Jefferson, in this letter, acknowledges that Congress is more in touch with the people and better positioned to know what will be acceptable to them. Jefferson has a set of recommendations he puts forward, in fact, a set of alternatives. Uh, and he has, uh, he has some preferences on the matter, but he knows that Congress has better judgment about what the people will accept. He says, the representatives of the people in Congress are alone competent to judge the general disposition of the people and to what precise point of reformation they are ready to go. Along a similar line of logic, let me point to several advantages of executive branch officials willingly adjusting policy based on information that they can gain from listening to Congress. First, new legislation is a blunt instrument. Administrative adjustments of policy can be more precise. There's always a risk of significant unanticipated consequences in writing new laws. If administrators are willing and able to adjust course within existing law, the risk of unanticipated consequences are less. 
Agencies have more expertise and knowledge of existing programs than Congress does. And they are usually better positioned than Congress to rework policy without collateral damage. It's generally better if Congress can get its grievances addressed without having to write new laws. A second advantage is that information provided via congressional debate uh, and hearings and you know, all the ways in which Congress can communicate to the executive branch, this is real-time input. It's responsive to changing conditions, to new problems as they arise. It tracks changing public opinion. Members of Congress are hearing from constituents about problems they face. Third, feedback from Congress is less ambiguous than other ways of communicating public demands to government. Election outcomes are always subject to numerous interpretations. It's often not clear what the public is authorizing or asking for when it chooses one candidate or set of candidates over another. But when Congress is communicating about a problem, that's a more concrete form of feedback than reading the tea leaves after elections. Fourth, congressional input offers an antidote to the kind of groupthink that can take hold in agencies or in expert communities. Congress is a body of generalists. Their job is to bridge between a distant government and local constituents, to communicate from constituents to Washington and back again. As such, they are very well suited to test policy against common sense to demand that executive branch officials successfully justify their actions up against that standard. Uh, this is a quotation from a political science work from 1965, one that I partic particularly like in thinking about the role of uh, Congress. It still applies, I think, quite well today, maybe, maybe even better today than when it was written. What we need, according to Lewis Dexter, what we need is somebody to question the specialists to harass them in thinking through and stating their fundamental assumptions, to request that they relate their doctrines to actual problems of ordinary people, and to keep on pushing until they do, and above all, to pay attention to the few specialists who question the prevailing point of view. Here's a recent example where one can see these advantages of having a Congress to speak directly to the executive branch to get an adjustment of policy. Shortly after President Biden took office in January 2021, amidst the coronavirus pandemic, the CDC issued new guidance for managing infection control in K through 12 schools. Under that guidance issued February the 11th, the CDC continued to recommend six feet of social distancing between students at all times in schools. Under this standard, very few schools would be able to reopen at full capacity. The CDC also recommended virtual school only for middle schools and high schools in all districts in the so-called orange or red zones of transmission, which covered 90% of all school districts in the U.S. About half of all schools in the U.S., uh, all public schools in the U.S. had reopened by that point if they had followed CDC guidance, they would have meant closing those, most of those schools back down again at that juncture. Not surprisingly, the CDC's approach drew fire in Congress. A particular opponent was Senator Susan Collins of Maine, a member of the Senate's Help Committee. I'm going to show you a clip from, from one of the hearings. This was the third such hearing at which Ho Collins had pushed this issue. She had asked questions of Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra at a hearing on February 23rd. She had put similar questions to Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services Rachel Levine on February 26th. This was the line of questioning she pursued with CDC Director Rochelle Walensky on March the 18th. Dr. Walensky. The CDC school reopening guidance has been at odds with what many public health experts are recommending. 
when we discussed this issue recently, I really detected a lack of a sense of urgency on your part to reopen schools. Let me just share a little bit with, with everyone here what the public health experts are saying. In USA Today, four prominent experts said, the recent school reopening guidance released by CDC is an example of fears influencing and resulting in misinterpretation of science and harmful policy. The American Academy of Pediatricians cautioned against strict adherence to six feet of distancing if that forces students into remote learning. And Dr. Jha, who testified before us just last week, said in an interview that the guidance, quote, didn't feel to most of us in the public health world as particularly well-grounded in evidence and science. Maine's own CDC director made the point to me that children are less likely to contract COVID in schools than they are in other settings. Dr. Jha also said uh, that we were focusing on the wrong things. We should be focusing on mask wearing, ventilation, and he said, I did not mention three feet versus six feet. I did not mention deep cleaning of surfaces. There's a lot that's going on that's gotten us distracted. We can keep teachers safe, we can keep kids safe, we can open schools and we have the ability to do that now. In the meantime, the negative effects on our children continue to grow. And I'm not just talking about the lost learning, I'm talking about social development, I'm talking about behavioral problems, stress on the children, on their parents. A hospital administrator may told me just yesterday that they're having children dropped off at the emergency room with behavioral problems and the grandparents or the parent who brought them just driving away, just leaving them there. We have got to get the schools reopened and you've presented no timeline at all for doing that and the CDC recommendations particularly on physical distancing of at least six feet are just not in sync with what most public health experts are recommending. So I'd like to know what you're going to do and when to get our schools reopened. Thank you for that question. Thank you for the conversation we had, and I'm very sorry you, it, it appeared like it wasn't urgent to me. I'm the mother of three, one of whom has been home for this entire year. This is an urgent issue. I understand the mental health challenges. I understand the educational challenges, this food insecurity. I, I, this is urgent. I don't. So this is a case where congressional debate is providing real time information to the executive branch. Shortly after this hearing, the CDC released new guidance on school reopening, adjusting the spacing requirements from six feet to three feet for students who were wearing face masks. In so doing, the CDC removed what was probably the biggest single obstacle to school reopening during the pandemic. And most uh, public schools were able to reopen before the end of the 2020-2021 academic year. In raising these questions in February 2021, Susan Collins is reflecting shifts in public opinion. Public opinion on the pandemic was very different by this point uh, in 2021 than it was in March of 2020. It's very different now at this point because vaccines had become widely available. It was very different than it had been in November 2020 when Biden was elected. We can't just rely on the messages about policy via, conveyed via election outcomes when the public's views and preferences on matters are changing. Congress holding these hearings and confronting agency officials about policy is providing useful information about pu public preferences. Collins' line of questioning provided useful political, political information. 
that even a moderate Republican like Collins was making, making such strong statements on the subject, indicated impatience with closed schools, uh, and that it extended beyond uh, members of the uh, conservative wing of the Republican Party. These public hearings also showed the value of a body of generalists putting questions to experts. Consider the types of specialized expertise and data that would be used in CDC decision making. Having this kind of public accountability to Congress forces the agency to consider issues from a broader perspective. Note how Collins draws directly from comments made by constituents in her own state, uh, calling on what she's heard from hospitals and parents. Unlike an agency which is focused on just one aspect of human well-being, the prevention of disease, Congress is considering the harms and benefits of the policy more broadly across all their affected constituents. But note that Collins did not threaten to rewrite the law or change the CDC's mandate. She just wants agencies, the, the executive agency, to consider the information she is providing and to adjust policy in light of it. What you saw here in this clip is a routine occurrence. Policy made and adjusted in dialogue between agency officials and Congress. It usually doesn't reach this level of visibility. The process often happens quietly and in a less adversarial fashion. Though uh, through, through letters, through phone calls, through routine hearings, even in communications around agency budget requests. A second reason why Congress's powers of debate and publicity are important is for executive, um, or is important for executive accountability is that it provides information about policy to the broad public. In other words, debate and publicity in Congress is sometimes is a, a way to communicate from the public to government. You know, constituents are unhappy about some aspect of policy and, want, and Congress then in turn communicates that desire for change. But in other cases, oversight is important for communicating to the public uh, what's happening in government. It informs them about uh, what is going on, what the issues are. In his classic 1885 study, Woodrow Wilson argued that the informing function of Congress is even more important than its legislative function. Unless Congress have and use every means of acquainting itself with the acts and the disposition of the administra administrating agencies of the, or agents of the government, the country must be helpless to learn how it is being served. And unless Congress both scrutinize these things and shift them, sift them by every form of discussion, the country must remain in embarrassing, crippling ignorance. This is from uh, his uh, classic uh, text, Congressional Government, 1885. The public will be ignorant about what is happening in government unless Congress informs them, raises the issues, forces the discussion. We see this today. Con Congress infor Congress's informing function pr promotes executive accountability through two important pathways. First, it shapes media coverage. What happens in Congress makes news. This is especially true of conflict among elite institutional players. Media coverage of national politics is indexed to elite con conflict. Issues that are not debated among top polish Washington policymakers, principally in Congress, generally receive little attention. If there's no debate on the issue, it's not deemed to be newsworthy. On the other hand, when an issue generates conflict among elected officials, as congressional investigations inherently do, that instantly draws media interest. Conflict makes an issue seem important and significant, worthy of attention. In other words, congressional investigation and attention enlists the media in Congress's informing function. Congress gets help from the news media when it decides to launch an investigation of administration policy. These efforts then in turn inform the public in great part because they earn media coverage. Here's an example clip illustrating this relationship. 
As you'll see, local news coverage takes direct cues from the questions asked in Congress as it puts together a news story about what went wrong with the um, Afghan Hey, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is facing more tough questions from lawmakers about the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Skylar Henry on the Senate grilling. Secretary of State Antony Blinken called the evacuation of U.S. forces out of Afghanistan heroic. In the end, we completed one of the biggest airlifts in history, with 124,000 people evacuated to safety. But lawmakers had tough questions about how the Biden administration executed the withdrawal, including leaving an unspecified number of Americans and Afghan allies behind. You evacuated 6,040 Americans and say only a couple of hundred remained. Your own department told this committee in July that there were 10 to 15,000 Americans in Afghanistan. There's a huge difference between 6,000 and 15,000. What happened to these other Americans? The secretary says the federal government did everything it could to get all Americans out ahead of the withdrawal deadline. Our consular team worked 24-7 to reach out to Americans who could still be in country, making 55,000 phone calls, sending 33,000 emails by August 31st. And they're still at it. Secretary Blinken faced the toughest questions from Republicans, but frustrations with the withdrawal was bipartisan. Mr. Secretary, the execution of the U.S. withdrawal was clearly and fatally flawed. This committee expects to receive a full explanation of the administration's decisions on Afghanistan since coming into office last January. There has to be accountability. And some question whether America is in more danger of a terrorist attack after leaving Afghanistan. Skyler Henry, CBS News, Capitol Hill. So note how each piece of this news story gets grounded in a question asked at a congressional hearing. So you have first the question, then a cut to a video of what's happening in the on the ground in Afghanistan. Journalists um, want to avoid being criticized for having an agenda or trying to drive the narrative themselves. Reporting on what kinds of questions are being asked in Congress allows journalists to cover the controversy rather than to critique administration policy in their own voice. As you may have noticed, the story also specifically flags that the criticism in Congress was bipartisan. This is a particularly important point. When an investigation only draws attention from one party, that communicates to the news media that the story may well be easily dismissed as just partisan bickering. When an investigation draws attention from both parties, the news media are more likely to view the investigation as more credible. A second way in which the informing function promotes executive accountability is that it affects president's political standing. Controversy in Congress takes a toll on public approval of the president. This is a longstanding finding in the literature, most recently demonstrated in a major study by Doug Kreiner and Eric Schickler. And the date should be 2014. I tried to correct that, uh, the slide, but it wouldn't let me edit. It's 2014. The, um, the kreiner schickler analysis is uh, quite sophisticated. It's a two-stage least squares model that takes account of both how congressional hearings affect presidential approval and how presidential approval conditions how many hearings uh, investigating the president the Congress will hold. Uh, the model also controls for a wide range of other factors known to affect presidential approval ratings, such as consumer sentiment, or presidential honeymoon periods, as well as key positive and negative sort of rally events that uh, also affect presidential approval. In preparation for this lecture this summer, I updated the kreiner schickler data to determine whether their analysis would hold across recent, polar recent polarized years. I was curious whether activity in Congress could have any effect on recent presidents, uh, given how consistently low their approval ratings have been in recent years, usually below 50 percent. Sort of wanted to know if there was any way Congress could drive it lower. I mean, could it get worse? Uh, I worked with a research uh, assistant to extend the Kreiner and Schickler data across the last decade, bringing the data collection up through the end of 2022. We identified all the congressional hearings 
examining allegations of misconduct on the part of the executive branch each month, so a tally for each month across all the hearings, both House and Senate, and then examined their collective effect on the President's approval rating. The answer is that hearings in Congress are still capable of driving down presidential approval ratings. They still exact a political toll on President's standing. If anything, congressional investigations have an even bigger negative effect on presidents than they used to, which, which surprised me. I didn't expect that would be the case. Um, the graph here shows the results of the updated kreiner stickler model, showing how the number of hearing days per month affects presidential approval. So hearing days means that every committee in Congress each day can have a hearing day. So there are many, hearing, many more hearing days than there are actual days, if you understand. Uh, so um, the, you, you, we can count the number of hearing days, of investigative hearings in Congress per month. And that's shown here across the x-axis from 0 to 70. Uh, and so you can see, so the red line shows the effect of increasing numbers of investigative hearings on presidential approval, right, approval ratings in the post-1992 period. And the blue line shows the effect in the pre-1992 period. So as you can see, the slope of the effect is steeper post-1992 than it was before 1992. According to the model, an additional four hearing days per month leads to a one-point drop in the president's public approval. As low as presidential approval ratings have been typically for recent presidents, they have, a, they have significant reason to worry about the loss of every percentage point. In assessing these data, it's important to know that recent Congresses have held fewer investigatory hearings than in the past. Congress is less active in, in, in holding these investigations than it was in the 70s and 80s and the 90s. So I wouldn't place a great deal of emphasis on the slope, the change slope, because there are fewer hearings in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the more recent time period. So a steeper slope also just reflects that um, the range, in some sense, is, is narrower. There are, there are fewer. Also, um, I can't say with high confidence that these two, um, uh, these two effects are that different from one another, because there's a lot of overlap at the low levels. So I, don't, I wouldn't place a, a great deal of emphasis on the difference. The point is that it still matters, that uh, when Congress is investigating the executive branch, uh, public approval of the president is uh, taking a hit. It exacts a political price on presidents, and presidents in turn would like to avoid paying that price. So that, that, that points to a further implication Congress does not need to use this power in order to constrain presidents because presidents at all times are a bit worried about it. And presidents and executive agencies anticipate the problems that hearings, investigatory hearings can cause for them. And they adjust their behavior preemptively in many cases to avoid this happening or to prevent this, this happening. This came up uh, in the panel uh, that we held, uh, held at lunchtime yesterday with uh, uh, Hank Jenkins Smith here at the Institute for Public Policy. This was a point he, he emphasized about how much agencies want to avoid attracting attention from Congress. Uh, so they try to prevent that by uh, anticipating what objections Congress might have. Uh, presidents have the same uh, incentives, and that those incentives rest in this reality, which is that when Congress uh, turns the light of publicity on the executive branch, it tends to uh, it tends to harm president's uh, public standing. Moving now to the second set of questions uh, for today, I want to ask, when and why does Congress use its powers of debate and publicity to hold executives accountable? What factors affect when Congress is willing to use these powers? What motivates Congress to use these powers? To track the 21st century politics of congressional 
uh, oversight of the executive branch. I identified all the news stories that appeared on the front pages of the New York Times between January 2001 and August 2023, featuring congressional charges of misconduct against the president. The graph shows the raw tally of such stories in unified and divided government. As you can see, there's roughly twice as much activity when government is divided, of this kind of activity when government's divided, than when the same party controls both Congress and the presidency. So divided government is shown in teal and unified government in purple. Divided government, as you know, is the normal state of affairs in American politics. So there's usually no shortage of, con of uh, congressional investigations of the executive branch going on. But high visibility, meaning front page news stories. So this is not, these are not the low profile investigatory hearings that occur. Um, these are the high profile ones. They still occur even under conditions of unified government. So even when the same party controls the president, presidency and uh, Congress, you still see some of this activity. It's less, but you still see it. Uh, I'm gonna uh, uh, point to a few examples that may spark some memories for you um, from recent Congresses with unified government. The Republican Congress during the first two years of the Trump administration held extensive hearings into allegations of Russian interference in the 2016 elections and whether Trump had abused uh, his power in firing FBI Director James Comey. The Senate Intelligence Committee's investigation was handled on a bipartisan basis. The leaders of the committee, Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina and Mark Warner of Virginia, jointly released their findings on Russian cyber operations. You might remember this moment. Uh, President Trump had tweeted out that Comey should hope that there are no tapes of their conversations. And when asked about it at a hearing, Comey said, Lordy, I hope there are tapes. These hearings drove a continuous stream of negative coverage of President Trump beginning in 2017. Democrats were complaining that Congress wasn't doing enough to investigate the president, uh, they said, because their uh, Republicans were in control of both House and Senate. But there were still some very high impact hearings that were held even though there was unified government. And this scandal continued on after the Democrats regained control of Congress in the 2018 elections. These bipartisan hearings laid part of the groundwork for the first Trump impeachment in 2019. Another example, after the 2018 Parkland shooting, school shootings in Florida, Senator Marco Rubio demanded an investigation into why the FBI failed to act on a tip that the agency had received just a month before from someone close to the perpetrator warning that he owned a gun and had talked about uh, uh, committing a school shooting. These hearings got a lot of news coverage, and they helped keep the issue visible in the public eye through 2018. In the end, 2018 turned out to be an important year for enacting new state-level gun safety regulations around the country, including, uh, including in Florida. Congressional hearings on this issue was just one part of the shifting gun control politics of 2018, but it was a factor, despite unified Republican government. Going back to uh, 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 the Obama administration, uh, when Democrats still had uh, control of the Senate in 2013-2014. After Edward Snowden's leaked revel revelations of bulk surveillance of metadata on Americans' phone calls in 2013, the Democratic-controlled Senate held a series, series of hearings into national security agency practices in the Obama administration. They demanded reforms and better protections of American civil liberties. The Obama administration went on to appoint an advisory panel on surveillance practices and then accepted some of the reforms that had been recommended. The reforms that were adopted were, uh, were uh, or fell quite short of what Senator Wyden and other critics in Congress wanted to see, but they showed that one can still see pressure from Congress being brought to bear under conditions of unified government 
uh, even today. In the summer of 2003, uh, this goes back to the George W. Bush years, a series of investigative reports from the Associated Press and Amnesty International began to raise the alarm about human rights abuses at Abu Ghraib prison in US-occupied Iraq. These reports came to much wider attention in 2004 when 60 Minutes did a report allowing photographs, uh, or they showed photographs of um, military personnel taunting prisoners. The photographs set off a firestorm with editorial boards calling for the resignation of Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. You might like to see the, this is Senator Joe Biden at the time holding up a picture of uh, Iraqi prisoners at Abu Ghraib. The Senate Armed Services Committee held hearings at which Rumsfeld, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and other generals testified. The visibility and uh, uh, attention put pressure on the U.S. military to hold uh, or to pursue an investigation. A dozen soldiers were convicted of dereliction of duty, and the top-ranking general in charge of the prison was demoted. The investigation also took a toll on public attitudes towards the Bush administration, with a significant drop in public approval in the wake of the scandal. Although we see a lot more investigatory activity in divided government, it's important to recognize that Congress still does investigate same party presidents, even in our polarized era. Why does Congress investigate co-partisan presidents at all? Wouldn't they be better off? not causing problems for their own party's president? In reviewing these cases, it's clear Congress does not find it easy to resist strong public demand for an investigation. This happened after the Comey firing, after the Parkland shooting, after the Snowden leaks, after the, le the leaks of photos of abuse at Abu Ghraib. The bar of public pressure is likely um, to need to be quite high before a Congress uh, with unified government, a Congress controlled by the same party as the president will do it, will actually pursue such an investigation. But the Congress still does respond to public firestorms around presidential actions by launching investigations, and they do so even against partisan self-interest. Another pattern suggested in my data, uh, looking at the high-profile hearings that have occurred in unified government, is that one sees these kind of co-partisan investigations on matters that are somewhat internally divisive within the majority party. Republicans were internally divided on relations uh, uh, towards Russia under Trump, with many Republicans aligned with the traditional pr um, pro-NATO stance, but Trump and other populist forces in the Republican Party more skeptical of that alignment. Democrats were divided on NSA surveillance under Obama, with traditional civil libertarian Democrats pitted against Democrats worried about national security post 9-11. Republicans were divided on the prosecution of the war in Iraq under George W. Bush, with a set of Republicans led by John McCain insisting on adherence to the Geneva Conventions, prohibitions against torture, and others aligning in support of what was termed as enhanced interrogation techniques. In other words, there's often in, an internal battle going on uh, within the party and possibly also within the president's own administration. And members of Congress are looking to shape the outcome of that battle when they're holding these hearings. Finally, generally speaking, a good rule of thumb is simply to remember that congressional and presidential interests are not ident identical even when the same party controls both. Uh, if you were able to attend the dinner last night with the panel with uh, uh, Oklahoma Senate President Pro Tem Greg Treat, you heard some similar discussions about how there can be internal friction within the same party across institutions here in Oklahoma. Members uh, often have some incentive to distance themselves from presidents of their own party as a matter of their own electoral self-preservation. Following midterms, it's often the case that members will blame their own party's president for the losses that their party suffered in those midterms. So 
these hearings allow them, allow members of Congress to put some distance between themselves and controversial things that happen in an administration. It's likely that these hearings that take place in unified government carry greater power than most congressional hearings because this, the very fact that they're being held sends some signals against self-interest. Thinking below the level of party politics, we should also consider the various reasons individual members have for confronting presidents, often of their own party. Members find that they gain personal visibility and electoral mileage out of confronting presidents. Members have incentives to make an issue of problems and challenges that their constituents face. Members can gain visibility and name recognition from their efforts to hold uh, executives accountable. This photo here on the far left is of St. Louis House member Cori Bush, who camped out on the Capitol steps in order to pressure the uh, Biden administration to extend the moratorium on evictions, uh, and uh, successfully brought pressure, and, and the administration uh, folded and extended that moratorium. It's long been a truism about Congress that members are highly sensitive to costs being imposed on constituents, and that's, I'm reflecting that in the second panel. Uh, to illustrate this point, I have a picture of New Jersey Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill. Uh, she's demanding the reinstatement of a tax break. It's very important to New Jersey uh, and to other residents of high-tax states, the tax deduction for uh, state and local taxes. She wanted that change to be part of uh, Biden's Build Back Better uh, plan, uh, which uh, in the end it was not, but she, uh, she's raising the issue. Blame shifting. Members often pursue efforts at executive accountability to make sure that constituents know who to blame. I have a photo here of Virginia Representative Bob Good, a conservative Republican who wanted to show that he's doing everything he can to halt the surge of migrants across the southern border. If his constituents are unhappy about the situation, and many probably are, he wants them to know that they should blame the administration. Finally, casework is an important source of information that members of Congress uh, draw on to identify problems that they uh, need to raise with uh, administrations. Here's a photo of freshman House Representative Dan Goldman taking credit for all the cases successfully resolved on behalf of constituents in his first 100 days in office. Members want to build a record for helping constituents, and um, as they do so, they become aware of problems um, with, uh, with, with federal policy, and that becomes a source for their activism in attempting to hold executives accountable. So in all these kinds of ways, members, individual members, have a personal motive to criticize presidents and raise issues with executive agencies. And they are empowered to do these things because they possess independent power bases. Obviously, members of the president's opposing party have the strongest incentives to confront the president. The president's party opposition is always looking for any grounds for criticism. But members of the president's own party also have meaningful independence. This scatter plot shows the relationship between winning congressional candidates' vote share and the president's vote share in their districts. Their co the co-partisan presidential candidates' vote share in the district. So uh, this is the uh, share of the vote that Biden received as compared to the share of the vote that Democratic members of Congress received and the share of the vote that Trump received in districts, and the share of the vote that Republican um, members of Congress received in their districts, to compare the two. If there was a one-to-one -one relationship, you would see all these dots fall along that red line. In other words, if it was just a perfect partisan relationship, you would expect to see that um, members of Congress are no more or less popular than, their, than the uh, presidential candidate of their party. But what you instead see is systematic overperformance. Members of Congress run stronger in their districts than presidential candidates of their party. This stronger standing in their own constituencies gives members of Congress some freedom and independence from presidents, it frees them up to communicate their objections to presidents and administration policy. 
The, this graph conveys an important truth about congressional elections. Most members of Congress are stronger in their districts than their party's presidential candidate. They stand on stronger foundations of local political support than presidents do. As I uh, conclude this discussion of executive accountability, I'll just recap the main points I've aimed to convince you of today. I've argued that Congress's powers of debate and publicity are important for accountability, both because members' complaints and criticisms inform presidents about what's going wrong in public policy, and likewise because those communications provide information to the public about what is going wrong inside government. I've also argued that Congress retains the capacity to make use of these powers because parties in Congress have interests that are not identical to presidents and because individual members can raise their own voices in complaint and criticism because they have independent political standing and personal incentive to do so. Congressional debate and publicity constitute a key source of horizontal accountability in our political system. You can think of vertical accountability as the kind that occurs in elections, from the people to the government. Horizontal accountability refers to the relationships among different parts of government and whether they operate to keep uh, each other, keep, keep the different parts of government within their proper bounds. Even when Congress doesn't have solutions, which they often don't, they create incentives for the executive branch to look for some, to try to find some solutions to address, address these problems. It's often the case that Congress is not going to be capable of coming together in collective action to solve the problems that they find. But debate and publicity doesn't require collective action. Congress can do those things, and then that in turn creates incentives for presidents and executive agencies to look for, look for answers. As I conclude this lecture series, I want to reference a quotation from Representative Barney Frank, who was a longtime Massachusetts congressman. As he looked towards his 2012 reelection bid, he joked about how hard it is to run for reelection when the public remains so dissatisfied with the state of the country and his own limited ability to fix it. He felt that he had made a difference in reforming Wall Street regulations after the 2008 financial crisis, but Americans were not happy. He said that he suggested to his staff that they produce a bumper sticker. Things would have sucked worse without me. In other words, acknowledging the public's unhappiness and trying to say, well, it would have been worse if I hadn't been there. But the joke, obviously, is that this is a terrible bumper sticker, and no one would ever campaign for office on the basis of such a claim. At some level, this is exactly what I've sought to argue about Congress's role in American democracy. We'd be worse off without it. Congress could do all things better. It could be more fully representative. It could write better laws. It could address more of society's ills. It could more thoroughly investigate and publicize executive agency shortcomings. But it still performs these functions of representation, lawmaking, and executive accountability. As a representative body, Congress takes account of America's diversity, and it does so in ways our winner-take-all presidency is not capable of doing. As a lawmaking body, most of the time Congress operates as a break on partisanship. It's exceedingly difficult for one party acting alone to enact laws. On the rare occasion that a party wins unified control of government, it can pass one or two major bills by itself. But most of the time, lawmaking requires substantial bipartisanship. If the American people want to see the two parties working things out, and that's what they say they want in public opinion polling, well, that's what happens in Congress more than anywhere else in national government. Finally, and with respect to executive accountability, Congress is continually engaged in debate and disputation that informs the, both the executive branch and the broad public about, about issues. It's not always coherent information. It's not always accurate. But it gives voice to constituents' complaints, and it guides executive officials on how to steer policy in better accord with public concerns. 
in a complex, polarized, distrustful republic of 330 million Americans, we need a Congress that performs these functions more than ever. We do not love our Congress. We never have, and yet we'd be worse off without it. That's, uh, that's what I have for you today. I am uh, happy to take any questions. I can start with one. I'm curious what you think about the trade-off between accountability from a public angle and a private angle. So with public hearings or private hearings um, in different ways of, of executive accountability. Um, I'm sure the, the public has some benefits, especially with the publicity, uh, but maybe private does too. So I'm just curious what you think about that trade-off. It's often not a trade-off. It's often that what we see in Congress is that conflict or, um, or uh, uh, objections that don't get addressed after private entreaties then go public. And so we're just seeing the conflicts that de didn't get resolved through those other kinds of communications. There's a great deal of communication going on between the Hill and executive agencies all the time. And many of these adjustments happen before they ever go public. Uh, and so we, we, don't, we don't see those. They're harder to observe. They're not in my data set on presidential ap approval, but uh, uh, it's going on. Uh, the point is that even when there's resistance on the part of executive agencies, when the president doesn't want to take uh, input from Congress, Congress has ways of incentivizing uh, uh, presidents and executive agencies to listen. Any other questions? Thanks. Um, could you talk a little bit about what I see as an inherent tension between providing political information, and you emphasize this political information, to what me, might be policy experts? And mm -hmm. I, I see that more in the Susan Collins clip that you showed um, than maybe some of the other um, areas that you talked about. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, c c information from Congress is always a blend of both policy and politics, you know. And it's not just what members are saying, it's also who's saying it. And so one of the most important pieces of political information that was conveyed in that, uh, that CDC hearing was that it's Susan Collins, the one raising these objections. So that's, that's, Im that's important political information separate from anything she might have to say. And then she's also pointing to disagreements among, pu among public health experts on the matters at hand. So it's, it's always blended in that way. And um, I, I think it's one of the great value added uh, contributions to policy making that Congress provides. It's different than what you can get just through expert communities discussing issues on the merits. It's also what people think. And that matters in, to democratic governance. And so what people think, that's communicated by who in Congress is prepared to raise these issues. So uh, th there's a lot of, a lot of um, uh, blending of those two forms of information, but that, I think, is a strength of Congress. Congress shouldn't think of Congress as a place for expert discussions. Uh, that's not what Congress's um, value is. I think of it you know, more in terms of uh, the, the Dexter quotation I provided. It's an antidote in some sense. It's just the common sense of what members of Congress who are not that different from the typical Republican and the typical Democrat back home, what do they think? And how can you answer them? And can you answer them in a way that makes sense to them? You mentioned in your presentation today that the number of hearing days could negatively affect the president or the mm -hmm. executive. Mm -hmm. The, we hear today, and I'm going to use the word uh, hearsay to be more polite than uh, some of the other words, and I think both parties do this, but do you think that the parties actually will do hearings based on hearsay simply because they know that it is throwing or casting light, negative light, on the executive? 
The, the short answer is yes. <laughs> There's political motives involved here. I think you can see that in the um, in this difference here, where there's a great deal more investigative action during uh, conditions of divided government. And I think that's where you see uh, hearings pursued on the basis of uh, less information, less public pressure, less demand, less uh, merit, <laughs> uh, more politicized investigations occur under those conditions than in unified government. I think um, there's, the public is right, can rightly be frustrated by hearings of this kind that look like it's just members of Congress throwing stuff up against the wall to see what sticks and you know, the, the quality of the information seems quite poor. Uh, that, uh, and that's why I think it's quite striking in that clip I showed you from local news where they flag when a hearing is bipartisan or not. That more information is conveyed when the issues are bipartisan or when, there, when a hearing is being held under conditions of unified government. So the quality of information coming from congressional uh, hearings, from these hearing days, varies. And these are the, the, it's higher quality information under some conditions than others. Uh, my, my point in showing these data is just to reassure that th it does still happen, even though obviously we live in a very partisan age, that we are still seeing some of this uh, uh, activity, even when it's against partisan self-interest. But obviously there's a lot more of it when it's consistent with partisan self-interest. Uh, thank you for this. Um, kind of related to that last point, it seems like it's kind of a bottom-up approach where Congress is, you know, conveying to the executive problems, but how much of it might actually be bottom-down where members of Congress are drawing attention to things that maybe the public hadn't even thought of, mm -hmm. and now the public is becoming concerned based on uh, these congressional hearings? Mm -hmm. I, I, wa I wanted to flag both of those pathways as important for executive accountability. That in holding executives accountable, members of Congress are raising concerns that they hear from constituents or ways in which they know their constituents are suffering, uh, but they're also informing constituents about what's going on. They are closer. They know more about policy, what, what's happening in government, than their constituents do. And so when they hold hearings, so, you know, when you think about these hearings that, that I flagged, public is, the public is learning information from these hearings. So the public didn't know that much about what was happening with NSA surveillance uh, during the Obama years. Uh, the, the, I mean, obviously, this is, this is a matter for intel intelligence. These were, this is uh, uh, top secret. Um, and so Congress is forcing that out into the open. It wasn't from public demands that led Congress to hold these hearings so much as uh, 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 the leaks and then, the, and then their, their, their own concern about what this meant and, you know, trying to nail this down. And then there was division among uh, elected officials, even within the Democratic Party, about what this meant. And so hearings were a venue to inform the public and to hash out the issues. And so both those things are happening and are very important. Uh, and it's some of the complexity of um, this uh, accountability relationship, that it, it runs both from the people to government and from government to the people. I, I, have, uh, oh, I have one question. So going back a little bit earlier to your earlier lectures, um, you know, and the claim, the accurate claim that most bills are bipartisan, but a lot of bills, or the few bills that are along largely partisan lines, one could argue are very influential bills. When do you think is partisanship useful? Is it sometimes necessary for a party to basically go along partisan lines? And do you think that in order to address some of the larger issues in the country, such as healthcare reform or climate change, 
will that require more of these large but rare partisan bills? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. It's a very important issue. Um, what I would say in response is that uh, you shouldn't interpret those few bills that uh, pass on party lines as the most important pieces of legislation that pass. They are, in many cases, they are important. But there are many other important pieces of legislation that are passing in a bipartisan manner. Take health care, for example. So Obamacare is important expansion of the social welfare safety net that occurred. Uh, and so we can point to that and say that was a landmark. And it was a landmark legislative achievement that happened on a party line basis. But if we're looking at the health care landscape, it was also important, all those bipartisan agreements to expand Medicaid coverage uh, at, negotiated between Democratic president, or Republican presidents and the Democratic Congress in the 1980s, also very important. Another very important change in health care policy was the creation of Medicare Part D which is prescription drug coverage for Medicare recipients. Before that, uh, before that 2006 legislation, there was no prescription drug benefit in, Medicaid, or Medi in Medicare except if you were in the hospital, but now outpatient medic, um, prescription drug treatment. Uh, and that happened uh, uh, during unified Republican control with um, a, a, a lot of bipartisan negotiation in the Senate between the, uh, the Bush administration and Senator Kennedy. So as you think about the health care landscape, where does Obama fit, Obamacare fit in? It's important, but health care policy has also been shaped by a lot of very important bipartisan deals. And that's true of all these policy areas you can think of. Second, I would say, when you think about something like climate change, anytime you're dealing with a policy uh, that can't be solved through one-off legislation, that's going to have to require ongoing cooperation over many years to come. You need a bipartisan agreement because power, power shifts. You know, unified government doesn't last for very long in our current conditions. And so if you don't have a deal, uh, uh, you don't have something that's acceptable to both parties, then you could expect to see policy shifts. Now, Obamacare, there was an effort to repeal Obamacare, and it failed. Um, and in that case, what I would point to is that Obamacare provided benefits that Republicans, a, a, a fair number of Republicans were reluctant to withdraw. But if you're talking about climate change, you're talking about policies that impose costs. And that easily triggers Congress's backlash. And so if you don't have a deal and your policy involves some political pain uh, for constituents, it's at risk of being repealed or undone, watered down. In Obamacare, for example, there was the medical device tax. You know, Congress got rid of that. The individual mandate, Congress got rid of that. Um, so it, you know, if, if, you, if, if what you need to do to achieve a policy goal requires the public to accept some level of costs, you need to confront the need for bipartisanship because that's the only way to protect the policy against uh, reversal when power, when the winds of, of politics and, and uh, when uh, party control shifts as it inevitably does. Hello. <clears throat> In the absence of informing functions of executive teams and representative bodies, how would you best recommend going about creating avenues to promote accountability? In the absence of uh, the informing functions, that the you informing about. function. So remember, Congress is not the only way in which constituents can be informed. It is an important way, but there are a lot of advocacy organizations that have the ability to shape public understanding as well. And so civil society uh, can investigate. And the news media can as well, though, as I discussed, the news media tends to follow elite conflict rather than to lead. But uh, civil society organizations uh, need to step in as well. And then that can create that bottom-up pressure from the public to demand change rather than 
uh, Congress exposing problems that then shapes public opinion. So ideally in a democratic society, you'll have a lot of associations where people are monitoring what's happening in, pub in public policy terms and raising objections where they need to be raised. And so I'd point to that pathway as well. Thank you.